Open your Bibles with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44 and 1 John chapter 5. Isaiah 44 and 1 John chapter 5. We are in our series, Christianity 101. The statement has been made that all religions are fundamentally the same. And we, in a, one of our previous messages, said that, yes, that all religions are fundamentally the same, except for what they teach about sin, salvation, heaven, hell, the nature of God, the nature of man, the nature of the church, the nature of eternity. Other than that, they are all fundamentally the same. And so that is our outline for Christianity 101. We are learning from the Scriptures what does the Bible say about these fundamental and foundational issues. One of the things, so I grew up in a Bible-believing Baptist church. My father was a pastor. He's home with the Lord now. And um, I really thought that all Christians were Bible believers. How many of you, that's kind of the, the understanding that you would have had, that all Christians get their authority from the Bible? It, that's just not true. And I found that out, you know, the hard way, just talking with people, just shocked. You believe that? That's where, where do you get that? Where, where did that teaching come from? Well, it's from the Bible. Well, can you show me that from the Bible? Well, I was told it's from the Bible. And so what happens is you end up with all of these different understandings of sin, salvation, heaven, hell, eternity, the nature of God. This morning, we're going to look at the nature of God. So now imagine, you're going to learn everything there is to know about God in this morning service. What are the chances of that? I heard Ravi Zacharias say that he uh, took a test when he was in seminary, and I, I can't remember what the question was that was asked. He said, the only question I could think of that was harder to answer than that was if they asked, explain God and give three examples. It, 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 come on, that's funny. you got to think about that. It, Explain God, really? See, here's the problem. Anytime we begin to define God, we diminish Him because He's indescribable. Words cannot express who He is, what He is, how powerful He is, how majestic He is. So what we have to do is we have to go to the Scriptures and we have to see what does the Bible say? How does the Bible describe this God that we worship. And those are the words, those, that's the understanding that we need to have. It's, it is fundamental and it's primary. So as we begin this, I want you to see, when we're looking at this concept of the nature of God, first of all, who is God? It's interesting, the Bible never defends God. The Bible declares God. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God. There, there's no defense of Him. There is the declaration of who He is. There's only one person who does not believe in God. The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And so, every person that is not foolish believes in God. A person who's foolish... Now, foolish people do foolish things. Right? Foolish people do foolish things. There was a kid riding his bike just rode right out in front of us one time. And being the kind and gentle pastor that I am, my window is down, I said, you're an idiot! <laughs> he, he laughed and he said, I know! <laughs> Foolish. Foolish. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Isn't that interesting? Then Jesus said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And so you have comfort or you have foolishness. You have belief in God or you have foolishness. Now do you recognize there's a lot of foolishness in the world right now. Because the simple fact is when you stop believing in God, you don't then believe in nothing, you believe in anything. And the things that people believe in are just the most outrageous and ridiculous things. Let me give you an example. People who don't believe in God, they say things like this, you can borrow money to get out of debt. You say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Well, that's because you're not in government. <laughs> you can borrow money. It just doesn't make any sense, does it? That you can help people by giving them incentives not to work. That's, that's silly. It, that's foolishness. You want to destroy a person 
take away their purpose for living. You destroy them. You ruin them. Give people everything. Don't require them to earn anything. And then if they make a mistake, remove the consequences of that behavior. What do you end up with? You end up with very foolish people. Why? Because all of those ideas are completely godless. The Bible says if man would not work, neither should he eat. The Bible says that the debtor is servant to the lender. The, the, the Bible is so clear on all of these concepts, and yet we have a system of government that is becoming more and more secularized and moving away from the foundational principles of God's Word on which it was founded. And the, the farther away we get from the truth, the more foolish we become. And so that's why it's vital that we as Christians understand who God is and the nature of God as presented in the Bible. So, first of all, who is God? The answer to this question provides one of the most profound distinctions between religions. Who is God? And not all religions claim the same God. That is the most primary answer. Let's look at who God claims to be. So we're going to go through these scriptures. I have them on the screen to make it a little easier for you to follow. Isaiah chapter 44, look at verse 6 with me. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. Jesus, the Son of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, beside the God of the Bible, there is no God. Look at verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Know what's awesome about that? God knows everything. And He doesn't know any God besides Himself. You say, what about the small g gods that are mentioned in the Bible? No, that's a, a, a lower deity or someone who claims to be a God. That's not God. There is only one true God. Amen. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. I don't have this verse listed, but it's a good one to go to here. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And look at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now, uh, I think that that identifies how we are to worship Him, with everything that we are. Amen? With everything that we are. Jesus Christ gave us uh, some commentary on this. Go to Mark chapter 12. Oh, and if you don't have a Bible with you, it's real hard to... Uh, participate in a service at Grace Baptist Church without a Bible. So we provide them for you. There's a Bible underneath the chair in front of you. Just grab that. And we are going to be all over the Scriptures. And there's a table of contents at the front of the Bible. And use it. You know, sometimes it's hard to find some of these passages. So be, take advantage of that table of contents. But Mark chapter 12, and look at verse 28. And one of the scribes came... And having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, and he's asking Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So fundamentally, what, what Jesus is saying, the most important thing to do is hear God, and we hear him through his word, and then we know the one true God of the Bible. And then he tells us what to do with that God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And so what we have in religions today is you have people that they claim to love God, and they claim to love their neighbor, but they don't love the God of the Bible. And because they don't love the God of the Bible, they love a God of their own creation, they don't know how to love their neighbor. So there are people that really do believe that it's okay to endorse whatever lifestyle a young person wants to live. They think that that's love. When we know that there are behaviors that are destructive to a young person, and if you love that young person, you will help them not to practice those behaviors. Is that common sense? 
right? So say no to, say, young people, this will help you. Get a t-shirt. Say no to debauchery. Okay? It'll mess you up. It's bad for you. Sin destroys. There's a way that, that seems right to a man, and the ends thereof are the ways of death. If we love you, we'll try to keep you off of those ways and lead you in the way everlasting. The way everlasting is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ Himself. Now, go with me to 1 John chapter 5. So this God, who is the God of the Bible? Well, God says there's only one, and it's Him. And then in verse 7, 1 John 5, 7, the Bible says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There was pagan influence in um, the changing of the Scriptures back at around 200 A.D. through a man named Origen, Adamantius Origen. And Origen did not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. He believed that, and that is that Jesus Christ was God. He believed that Jesus was less of a God than God the Father is. Through the influence of people like Origen, there were some manuscripts that were copied that did not include 1 John 5, 7. Because if Jesus, if this verse says that Jesus is God, then men like Origen who didn't believe Jesus Christ was God, they would have to remove it from the text. We have some well-meaning but very destructive people in Christianity today that in modern translations of the Bible remove this verse. So you might be using one of those Bibles today and I just had you read a verse and you're looking at it, wait a minute, it's not there. It just what, what, where, where is that? And what they do, sometimes the NIV or the NASB or the ESV, they take verse 6 and divide it into two verses so they can keep the numbering. But 1 John 5, 7 is gone. And in the footnote note, it says, Some later manuscripts include, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Well, the simple fact of the matter is, we have men from before origin quoting 1 John 5, 7. We have Syriac lectionaries. Now, Syriac was a language. It was uh, the, the, the language of Aramaic is used in the Bible. Syriac is very close to that. In the first century, churches would read a portion of Scripture at a certain time of year, and we have those lectionaries where they were reading 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And that's 300 years before the oldest manuscripts they have that, that remove 1 John 5, 7, and those manuscripts were from the 3 and 400s. So when you see that they're only found in later manuscripts, that's later Greek manuscripts. God never promised to preserve His Word in Greek. He just promised to preserve His Word. Amen? Amen? And then the Bible says, These things write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church, the local assembly, is the pillar and ground of the truth. That is where it's grounded. That's where it's kept. That's where, how God has, used, God has used the church to preserve the Bible all through history. And then the Bible says in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God promised to preserve those words for us so that we can hold them in our hands and read them today. And it is interesting that one of Satan's greatest attacks on the Godhead is the denial of the Trinity. And it isn't it also interesting that, 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 that the primary verse in the Bible on the Trinity that is attacked is 1 John 5, 7. And yet, it is in your, in your Bible, and it ought to be in your Bible. Amen? Let God be true and every man a liar. And so the Bible says here, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are... One. You can trust that. You can count on it. You can rely on it. You might say, well, wait a minute. The, the, the editor of my study Bible says that it shouldn't be there. That's because that's what he was taught in seminary. And that lie is just perpetuated in seminary every year, every year, every year. And most of the people have never looked at the evidence. And the simple fact is that is in the Bible. It ought to be in the Bible. You can rely on it. You can trust the Bible that you hold in your hands. Isn't that a blessing? Aren't you glad you don't need a Bible scholar when you have a Bible? You know the word scholar, it means one who's mastered their subject. You know that there's no such thing as a Bible scholar? Can anyone master the Scriptures? 
Does anyone know the whole counsel of God? No, no, it's a silly argument. That's why in the qualifications for the pastor, the qualification for the pastor, it never says one who's mastered the Bible. It says not a novice, apt to teach. What does that mean? One of the other requirements explains it, full of faith. Full of faith. Just believe the Bible. I don't believe scholars. I believe the Bible. Where the scholars agree with the Bible, man, they're really helpful. Where they disagree with the so-called scholars, where they disagree with the Bible, let God be true and every man a liar. Billy Sunday, the old evangelist, he said, if scholarship disagrees with the Bible, scholarship can go to hell. (laughs) And so the scholars did not like it that he said that. Well, then don't disagree with the Bible. Amen? Now, I didn't cuss just then. Billy Sunday did. I just quoted Billy Sunday. All right, let's go on. Go to the book of Genesis. I think the book of Genesis is a really good place to learn some things about God. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. If you're here today and you're thinking, this preacher must be the most crazy person I've ever seen. It's probably true. But I just want you to understand the heart behind Grace Baptist Church. Man, we don't hate anybody. You know, we don't think that we're better than anyone. It's just there are a lot of churches that claim to believe the Bible. Here at Grace Baptist, we do believe the Bible. All right? The problem is there are a lot of people who claim to believe the Bible. They just don't believe what it says. And we actually believe the words. You understand the Bible by studying its words. These issues of whether a verse is supposed to be in the Bible or not, it's really important, isn't it? It's only important if the words matter. And Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Do you know what Jesus said is going to judge people at the last day? The words that I speak unto you. That's what's going to judge them. That means he's got to preserve them. How can God hold somebody accountable for something he's never given them? So it's really important that we understand that. All right, Genesis chapter 1. God is a Godhead, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Do you see that? Us, our, and it's God. It doesn't say let the gods say. It says let God say. I'm sorry. And God said, let us make man in our image. Who is the us? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Godhead. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. It's interesting. God said, let us, in verse 26, and then in verse 28, God blessed them. So you have plural and singular talking about the same God, the Godhead. God is three what's, one who. Three what's. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God. And that's why the term the Bible uses is the term the Godhead. The Godhead. The Godhead is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. You say, I don't understand that. That's exactly right. You can't understand it. It's God. We can't. He, he is infinite. He's beyond our finite understanding. So our job is not to explain God. Our God job is to declare the God that is given to us in the Scriptures. All right? So that's Genesis chapter 1. Look at Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 22. And the Lord God said... Behold, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and live forever, and therefore God set him outside the garden. So here in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 1, let us. Here in Genesis chapter 3, let us. Look at Genesis chapter 11. The account of the Tower of Babel. Verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us, see that? Let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. 
So now look at this. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So here you have, let us go down, and then it says the Lord did this. Who's the Lord? The Lord's God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're not going to take the time to trace it down. We've done it in other messages. But there, it, it, all three are scriptures. God the Father is called Lord. God the Son is called Lord. And God the Holy Spirit is called Lord. The Lord God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is the God as presented, that is God as presented in the Bible. Godhead is a trinity. The central feature that distinguishes cults from biblical Christianity is the doctrine of the Trinity. All cults have a distorted view of this doctrine. Go with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Look at verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Can we just read this together? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. All right? So the formula for baptism is you baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's God. That's God. In another passage, you'll say, baptize them in the name of Jesus. Well, Jesus is God. Baptize them in the name of the Spirit. Well, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's how people were baptized. This is the formulation that Jesus Christ gave us so that we can understand who the Godhead is. And so it's important to see what we're saying here. The central feature that distinguishes cults from biblical Christianity is the doctrine of the Trinity. All cults have a distorted view of this doctrine. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 3. There's the slide that I was looking for. Matthew 3, look at verse 16. This is the baptism of Jesus Christ, the water baptism. Then Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So at the baptism of Jesus Christ, what do you see? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all present at the baptism of Jesus Christ, but functioning differently. Jesus Christ is the one being baptized, God the Father is the one speaking from heaven, and God the Holy Spirit is descending like a dove. So you have three persons in one Godhead. That's the God of the Bible. And the cults, they don't agree with that. All right? So the message of the Bible is that the God who created you in order to save you from the sin that has driven you from fellowship with Himself, gave His only begotten Son, and that's Jesus Christ. What does the only begotten Son mean? Again, if you have a modern translation of the Bible, your verse on John 3.16, where the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Your Bible might say, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. The problem is in John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, in verse 11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not, but to as many as received Him, to them gave He power to be called the sons of God. So there's no one and only Son. How many of you are glad you're saved? If you're saved, you become a son of God. You ladies might be saying, well, what about daughters of God? The reason it doesn't say daughters is because the Son had the right to inheritance. And when you get saved, you're an equal part in the body of Christ, an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We all become sons of God. That's where gender-inclusive translations of the Bible lose doctrinal distinction. Isn't that amazing? The other thing that's amazing is that Christians would try to remove the gender identity that God has put in the Scriptures, and then we wonder why the world has gender confusion. That's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. Uh, Y'all have heard. I know that I've told you about the new transgender G.I. Joe doll. Gee, I don't know. I told you. Again. See, the Bible doesn't leave us like that. The Bible tells us exactly what is true. Amen? The Bible tells us what's true. And that idea that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God is not what the Bible says. The Bible says He's the only begotten Son of God. What is that? How, what, what in the world? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and she was with child of the Holy Ghost. That's the only time God ever did that. And so Jesus Christ is the only child born physically of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born spiritually of the Holy Spirit. 
being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we're born again. That's a spiritual birth. Jesus Christ is the only one who was born physically of the Holy Spirit. He's the only begotten Son. And so that's vital. When we understand the Godhead, we understand that Jesus Christ existed before Bethlehem. Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, the Bible says, Thou hast prepared for me a body. That's what Jesus Christ is saying to the Father. Jesus existed before. He didn't have the physical body. The physical body is what was born of Mary. God the Father was involved. God the Holy Spirit was involved. And how many of you think God the Son was involved in that? Yeah. And so that's the Godhead in His baptism, in His birth. It, it's the clear teaching of Scripture. And the Bible message is that the God who created you in order to save you from the sin that's driven you from fellowship with Him gave His only begotten Son. This, these two paragraphs are from James Knox's book on a firm foundation. And it's such a good statement. He said, the Bible says that the Son of God, or, I'm sorry, the Bible says that Son was God manifest in human flesh. He came to make a way that you might be saved from sin and have fellowship with your Creator. He came to be the life everlasting. Jesus Christ not only is life, but He gives us life. And if we are in Him, we can have everlasting life. We get in Him when we receive Him as our Savior. He comes to dwell in us and the Holy Spirit places us in Him. You say, I don't understand that. We don't have to understand it. We just believe it because it's what God said in the Scriptures. Um, what I want us to look at, the primary area of differences in religions is what they say about Jesus Christ and what they say about the Godhead. And then based on that, what they say about salvation. So let's look at what Jehovah's Witnesses say about the Godhead. And what I've done is I've gone to their literature. This isn't some Baptist preacher making a statement about Jehovah's Witnesses. This is from the Jehovah's Witness' own website. All right, so this is what they say about the Godhead. For one thing, the Bible does not mention the word Trinity. Okay, it doesn't mention that. But it doesn't mention Jim Alter either. But it does say, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jim Alter got to do that. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Jim Alter. There's no way that I can be saved unless Jesus Christ saves me. Isn't that wonderful? And so that idea, there, there's no, the word Sunday school is not in the Bible. You know, we have Sunday school. You, know, you see what I mean? That, that argument is just a silly argument. Uh, for one thing, the Bible does not mention the word Trinity. Oh, let me just say this. It does use the word Godhead three times. All right. For one thing, the Bible does not mention the word Trinity. For another, Jesus never claimed to be equal to God. He said, I and my Father are one. Show us the Father. Have I been with you so long, Philip? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's why the Jews wanted to kill him, because he claimed to be equal with God. So this is liar, liar, pants on fire. For another, Jesus never claimed to be equal with God. Instead, Jesus worshipped God. A third line of evidence concerns Jesus' relationship with his followers. Even after he was raised from the dead to the spirit realm, see, they don't believe in a, in a bodily resurrection. Jesus rose as a spirit is what they're saying. Um, even after he was raised from the dead to the spirit realm, Jesus called his followers my brothers. Were they brothers of Almighty God? Of course not. But through their faith in Christ, God's preeminent Son, they too became sons of, one, uh, of uh, the one Father. It's just complete heresy what they teach. They do not believe that Jesus is God. They do not believe that He is God's only begotten Son. They don't believe in any of that. And, of course, they don't believe in the Godhead Trinity. And this is from their own uh, website. All right. What, what do the Mormons believe? The Mormons. The Trinity, again, this is from the, their website, the Latter-day Saints website. The Trinity of traditional Christianity is referred to as the Godhead by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormon. Like other Christians, Latter-day Saints believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost. Yet, church teachings about the Godhead differ from those of traditional Christianity. For example, while some believe the three members of the Trinity are of one substance, Latter-day Saints believe they are three physically separate beings, but fully one in love, purpose, and will. All right? So what they, they do not believe in the Godhead. They believe there's God the Father, and that Jesus Christ and Lucifer were brothers, and that Jesus, by being really good, uh, he was exalted to a higher level of being a God. And they don't believe in the Holy Spirit at all. They believe that the Holy Spirit is a, is a force or a power 
They don't believe in the person of the Holy Spirit. So they, don't, they have a completely different God than we do. What's interesting is Origen, who I mentioned earlier, he believed that souls exist forever. That means that they, they pre-exist. They don't begin at birth, that they pre-exist. And the good souls became angels, the bad souls became demons, and the neutral souls became people. That's Mormonism. That's the exact teaching of Joseph Smith. Nothing new under the sun. Isn't that amazing? Origen taught that in 200 A.D. Here you have the Mormons started in the 19 or in the 1850s, and it's just it's it's really bad stuff. All right, so they are not Christian. Notice that they say we we separate from traditional Christianity on nothing important, just God. <laughs> so, just God. Um, how many of you have heard of the Way International? All right, over in New Knoxville, it's so funny, Lydia. Yesterday, last night, sent us this video she found of Christians breakdancing. And it's that video of a, of a service there at the way. And she didn't know that that's, I was going to talk about them today. It's hilarious. Um, so we actually had someone from the way come and try and disrupt one of our services one time. If you'd like to hear that, it's on the website. We're actually able to record the interaction that I had with them. And uh, you, I think the title is here, uh, Pastor Alter, Answer a Cultist in a Church Service. The way is a cult, and we need to understand that. And so I'm going to give you um, some clear understanding of who they are. This is the title of one of their documents on their website. Jesus is not God. Now, how many of you see that they have a big problem already? All right. The Bible says that if someone says that Jesus is not God come in the flesh, he's antichrist. All right, so let's just, let's just, so for the guests, let's let them know what Grace Baptist is like. So the, according to that verse, what is a word that we would use to describe the way? Antichrist. It's not okay. It's a cult. That doesn't mean we're going to go hurt anybody or fight anybody or anything like that. We just identify. The Bible says mark them and avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. All right? Um, this is, again, from their own website. Many professing Christians have been taught to praise Jesus. However, the Bible does not teach that Jesus Christ is to be praised or thanked or addressed in prayer. God, as the source of every blessing, is the only one to receive our praise, thanksgiving, and prayer. Right from the beginning, the Scriptures tell us that praise goes to God, not to Jesus. It, Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 5, Second, 1 Timothy chapter 5. It, it just, the, all through the Scriptures you praise Jesus Christ. It's, this is, it's just heresy. One reason for the practice of praising and praying to Jesus may be people's misunderstanding that Jesus and God are one and the same. But the Bible shows that Jesus Christ is not God. He is the only begotten Son of God. For further study on our website, see the scriptures listed under Jesus Christ is not God. And th this is, I'm sorry, this is continuing what they're saying there. So they're recommending references. And one God uh, in this is what God says section. Also see our bookstore section to order the book, Jesus Christ is not God. All right, so when you see a group like that, their, here's their purpose. Their purpose is to drive people away from Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. And so when people say all religions are fundamentally the same, that, that's just that's ludicrous, isn't it? it? It just doesn't make any sense at all. All right, what about Islam? What does Islam say about Christianity? And let me give you an example of why this is such a problem. Um, number one, there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, and th they need to know who Jesus Christ is. Right? They need the gospel. They need to be saved. Um, there was a book written by a man named Peter Kreeft, and he was Peter Kreeft was one of the founders of the Evangelicals and Catholics Together movement, along with Chuck Colson and some others. And he wrote a book called The Ecumenical Jihad, and I have a copy of it if you'd like to see it. And in that book, he has this vision, and he says that um, in a dream he saw he was on a beach, and it was after death. And there was Muhammad, there was Krishna, um, there was Jesus, um, I think that was it. And since they all worship the one true God, 
the, the monotheists, they worship the one true God, that they're going to have this opportunity in purgatory for everybody to come and believe in the one true God. And so the point of the ecumenical jihad is this. Since we all worship the one true God, we ought to get along now. And how many of you have heard of the evangelical writer J.I. Packer? You heard of J.I. Packer? He wrote, uh, his famous book is Knowing God. So on the, his endorsement for the book Ecumenical Jihad, he says, what if he's right? So let's find out what Islam teaches about the Godhead and see if it's any different than what the Bible says about the Godhead. And again, we're allowing these people to speak for themselves, so we're going to quote the Quran. And since I don't speak Arabic, I'm doing the English translation. All right? So this is Quran 573. They do blaspheme who say Allah is one of three in a trinity, for there is no God except one God. And beware the day when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? He will say, exalted. So he said, the Quran says, this is what Jesus is going to say to Allah. Exalted are you. It was not for me to say that to which I have no right. If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is in yourself. Indeed, it is you who is knower of the unseen. I said not to them, except what you commanded me, to worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. And I was a witness over them as long as I was among them. But when you took me up, you were the observer over them, and you are over all things witness. So this is what the Quran says about Jesus Christ. So it's saying that Jesus never said that he was God, that he never claimed to be one with the Father. And so one of the problems that we have in Muslim missions is we have evangelical groups that teach Muslims that the God of the Bible is Allah. That's not true. It is not true. Allah was the moon god. And he was a, he was a, a pagan deity that Muhammad, he, when he made up this religion, he blended it with um, the, that pagan religion. He took cues from the Old Testament and from Judaism and created this, this false religion. So Islam, Islam statements about Jesus. Now, what about the apostolic and oneness Pentecostal movement? So like Sydney Apostolic Church or the oneness Pentecostal movements in America. We have looked at what Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and Islam and the way, what they say about God, what they say about Jesus Christ, what they say about the Godhead. Who are the oneness Pentecostals? The modern Pentecostal movement is generally regarded to have begun in 1901 in a chapel prayer meeting in Topeka, Kansas, led by Charles Parham, a teacher at Bethel Bible College. In 1906, the Pentecostal experience of speaking in tongues burst on the scene during a revival in an African-American Baptist church on Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California. And so all charismatics trace their, the roots of the modern charismatic movement to what's called the Azusa Street Revival that's being mentioned here. The other thing that I, I do want you to notice is that it's 1906. We're not talking about A.D. 33 with Jesus. How many of you know that 1906 is after that? You all know that? Okay, you learn great things here. All right, now, following these beginnings, Pentecostal preachers and churches spread rapidly, coalescing into various denominations and factions. In 1913, one popular teacher, Ari e. McAllister of Toronto, Ontario, everything bad comes from Canada, Patrick. It just, no, that's, sorry, just a, that's just to insult our, our Canadian members. In 1913, one popular teacher, R. E. McAllister of Toronto, Ontario, began teaching that the Trinity doctrine was untrue and that baptism should be done correctly in Jesus' name only, not in the traditional Trinitarian formula. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We're not supposed to do that, according to him. Other preachers, such as J. Frank Ewart and John G. Shep, joined McAllister in this non-Trinitarian perspective. So what do oneness Pentecostals and um, apostolics, what do they believe? Now, notice what I have here. They're called Jesus-only Pentecostals. What do they believe? 
All right. Oneness Pentecostals declare that the Godhead consists of only one person and deny the traditional doctrine of the Trinity. They maintain that the only real person in the Godhead is Jesus. So that's where the concept Jesus only comes from. There's not God the Father and there's not God the Holy Spirit. There's only Jesus. All right. Thus, they are often referred to as the Jesus only movement. They maintain that God exists in two modes, as the Father in heaven and as Jesus the Son on earth. So when He's in heaven, He's the Father. When He comes to earth, He's the Son. But it's only Jesus. Nevertheless, they are the same person, not two separate persons. The Holy Spirit is not regarded as a person at all, merely a manifestation of Jesus' power or a synonym for Him. So when the Holy Spirit does something, that's only the power of Jesus. There's no such thing as the Holy Spirit. Now, l- let me just ask you a question. Does that sound anything like Christianity? Okay, two people answered. Does that sound anything like Christianity? No. no. It's completely foreign to biblical Christianity. Now, let me just say this. Um, So this is Christianity 101. This is fundamental, foundational Christianity. How many of you think that maybe the Trinity is foundational Christianity? It's just, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, God the Father, and the Spirit moved down the face of the deep, God the Spirit. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So you have order, structure, and submission in the Godhead, the three persons of the Godhead. God the Father ordains, God the Son speaks, and God the Holy Spirit executes. That's that's the Godhead. That's biblical Christianity. All right? Anything that denies that is not biblical Christianity. Um, The other thing that I want to say is this. Here's, Here's the mistake that Christians make. Especially Christians, you know, God has gifted all of us. So spiritual gifts, uh, you have the gift of the teacher that God's given the church. And so that's one of the spiritual gifts God's given me. I love teaching the Word of God. The gift of of prophecy, that's not seeing the future. That's, That's discerning right from wrong, right? And then God also gives the gift of mercy. The problem, and, and we need mercy. People who have the, the, the prophecy gift, you know, the black and white thing, we really need mercy. And, amen? We really need mercy. The problem is the mercy people really need the prophets. Because we might have some mercy people here, and here's the first thing that you're thinking. I know somebody who goes to a oneness Pentecostal church. And here's what the prophet says. So? Are we basing the truth on what that, that nice person is doing? Or are we basing the truth on the Word of God? I'm not denying they're nice. And let me say this. I'm not denying that they love the Lord. But if they love the Lord as presented in their church, they're loving a God that is not the God of the Bible. How many of you think that's important? Seriously. And so what needs to happen is these deceived people need to be corrected, not endorsed. The reason I stopped going to the Gideons was because the apostolic pastor was a a part of it. They have the apostolic pastor leading prayer in the meeting where I was. Well, the Bible tells me to mark him and avoid him. Not pray for his ministry. So this is, and and here's one of the issues that we have in Christianity. If if you've been to Grace Baptist and you've come to a Sunday school class or you come to a Sunday night service or Wednesday night Bible study, you hear this kind of truth. Sunday mornings, we generally try to keep it more open so that we don't lose influence. But if you're here and you are open to false doctrine, shame on you. You need to get right with God. You need to get right with God because what you're doing is you're saying that what God has demanded is not good enough. That I need to submit to what other people are saying and doing. And so it's real important that you get that. And and I hope what you're seeing from Pastor Jim today is this is an unapologetic stand. I'm not sorry that I'm teaching that oneness Pentecostalism is is, um, wrong. Okay? So I'm I'm not sorry about that. This is something that we need to do. We need to know what the truth is. Amen? Amen. All right. So now, let's go on. Nevertheless, they are the same person, not two separate persons. The Holy Spirit is not regarded as a person at all. Jesus is said to have two natures, His human and divine. 
Thus, when he died, only his human nature died. Also, when Jesus prayed, it was his human nature praying to his divine nature, not to a separate father in heaven. So it's like Gollum, you know, talking to Schmeagel. <laughs> I like tight brushes. Let's get them filthy hobbitses. That's what Jesus was doing? Doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, all right, I'm, I'm getting mad. All right, the oneness view of salvation. How many of you get mad when somebody says something bad about your mom? Right? Somebody said something bad about... No, I'm not talking about your mom jokes because those are funny. But I'm talking about when someone really says something mad about your mom, uh, you, you're going you're to fight, Right? Well, aren't we supposed to love God more than our moms? That's what Bob Curlis said earlier today. So that's what we're supposed to do. All right, the oneness view of salvation. So this is the apostolic Pentecostal view of salvation. Oneness teachers would agree that salvation requires putting one's full faith in the Jesus of oneness doctrine. That is the Jesus who is the total, to, 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 the totality of the Godhead, who died on the cross as an atonement for sin, and who rose again from the dead. So in order to be saved, you can't believe in the Godhead. You have to believe in only Jesus. That's the teaching. Number two, repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus. Acts 2.38 is used as evidence that the early church baptized only in the name of Jesus. They maintain that baptism in the Trinitarian formula is invalid since it implies belief in three gods. Well, Jesus wasn't teaching three gods. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the, the, the Bible is very clear on that. And they believe that baptism is a part of salvation, that you have to be baptized to be saved. Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He was dealing with all the schisms in the church and who baptized who. And he said, I thank God I baptized none of you. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What does that tell us? That baptism is not a part of the gospel. Baptism is important. It has to do with church membership and identity with Jesus Christ, all of that, but it has nothing to do with salvation. All right? It comes after salvation. The apostolic church teaches that you have to be baptized to be saved. Then they claim that Matthew 28, 19 is not to be taken as a command to baptize in that formula. Well, I'm glad they're telling us that. I'll go with Jesus rather than what they say. All right, then speaking in tongues. Like most traditional Pentecostals and Charismatics, oneness Pentecostals teach that speaking in tongues is a gift to be exercised today. However, unlike most traditionalists, the oneness movements maintain that speaking in tongues is not just a post-conversion indicator of the filling or baptism of the Holy Spirit, but an essential ingredient in the salvation experience. So if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Then adherence to holiness standards. One, most oneness Pentecostals teach that once salvation is gained initially by the preceding ingredients, it must be maintained by daily adherence to legalistic codes of personal behavior. Alcohol and tobacco are prohibited. Women are not allowed to cut their hair, wear short dresses or slacks, use makeup or wear jewelry. Men are expected to dress conservatively, white shirts and dark slacks, be clean shaven and have short haircuts. Now, we agree with a lot of that stuff that Christians ought to do those things. But to maintain your salvation... You know, you can only wear a white shirt. You can only... It doesn't make any sense. See, the Bible, the, the Bible tells us exactly what to do on these things. Ladies, be modest. Right? Men, be sober. The, the, the Bible tells us. We have Bible words and understanding. It's when you start making the list of the exact type of apparel, then you move into things like the Amish and others that are legalistic churches. They're legalistic movements that add things to the Bible. Um... Let me see. Violations of these codes may result in a loss of salvation and exclusion from church membership. Go with me to Galatians. Chapter 1. So let me ask you a question. The gospel that I just showed you, is that a different gospel than the gospel of the Bible? Okay. Um, in the overflow, is that gospel different than the gospel of the Bible? Amen. All right. Got to make sure they were awake back there. You guys look great today, by the way. Um, so look at verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him 
that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, there's not another gospel, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So it's really important that we get this. Repetition in the Bible is God's volume control. When He repeats it in the same context, He's really trying to get our attention. We, we don't want to endorse people that pervert the gospel. We accurse them. Right? That is damned to hell. This is damnable doctrine. It is heresy. Even Hank Hanegraaff, who is open to so many things, the Bible Answer Man, the Christian Research Institute, he says one of the big problems we have in Pentecostalism is that Charisma Magazine, the, that's the, the publication for the charismatic churches, they say that it's, that it's a splitting hairs of doctrine, that the Trinity is splitting doctrinal hairs. That's ridiculous. And Hanegraaff is saying that that's ridiculous. So we need to understand that oneness Pentecostalism is no more Christian than Jehovah's Witness. It's no more Christian than Mormonism. It's no more Christian than the way. It's very important that we understand they are worshiping a different God than we worship. How influential is this movement? This is going to blow your mind. They have around 20 million followers. There are some 40,000 churches around the world that practice oneness Pentecostalism. Anyone heard of T.D. Jakes? Oneness Pentecostal. A couple of years ago, he came out and said, well, you know, because people started to find out about it. He said, well, I disagree with some of the things Oneness Pentecostalism teaches, but I still have problems with the Trinitarian formulation. So T.D. Jakes has been preaching a different God than we worship all of these years, and yet he's accepted everywhere. It's, it's really a big problem. And so what we need to understand, Christianity 101... When people say that religions are fundamentally the same, one of the reasons they can get away with saying that is because Christians are afraid to identify error because they're going to hurt someone's feelings. What's better, hurting their feelings now and having them go to heaven or protecting their feelings and having them go to hell? You see, salvation is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. And the Godhead is real. The Bible says, The Father judgeth no man, but rendered all judgment to the Son. Isn't that interesting? Those are two persons of the Godhead identified in the judgment of mankind. So, it, Christianity 101. The Godhead is fundamental to Christianity. Who is our God? He's the God of the Bible. That is 20 million people who call themselves Christian, but do not believe in the God of the Bible. The nature of God. God is a trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who's the Lord? The Lord God. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. Amen? And here's what happens. The Bible says in the book of Acts, Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because you violated God's law and you have faith in the finished work of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is the gospel. Now, look, let me ask you a question. How many other churches in Sydney do you think did this this morning? Why? This is not popular. How often do you hear something like this on Christian radio? Not very often, because it's really hard to, to raise money when you teach like this. We're not worried about that. We're worried about what has God said. Who is He? How has He revealed Himself in Scripture? And are we being faithful to Him? Amen? And I'm so glad that you all were here today to hear this message. It's really important that we care about the truth. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 3, and let me finish this. God knew that this is the way that the world would be before He returns. So remember, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Jesus writes seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor. And each of those churches was a literal historic church that had the problems that Jesus was addressing. But each of those churches also represents a period of time 
And it's very clear in the Scriptures. And we're living in the last time, the Laodicean age. And so the message to the church at Laodicea is really important to us. So look at Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now these titles, those are all titles of Jesus Christ that Jesus is giving for Himself. The titles that Jesus gives Himself tell us what is the problem in that church. What are the doctrinal problems in that church? And what is the problem of that age in general? So when He says that these things, verse 14, these things saith the Amen. Well, Amen means it is true. So what Jesus said was in the Laodicean period, you'll have people in the culture and in the churches questioning what truth is. Is that the age that we live in? And then look at what He says. The faithful and true witness. Now, Jesus Christ is a faithful and true witness. But what He's saying is the problem in the Laodicean church age is going to be this. We're going to have preachers who are unfaithful and untrue witnesses. Do you know what we have in Laodicean church age? Preachers who are, who are unfaithful and untrue witnesses. So you've got oneness Pentecostal preachers saying that there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit, there's no such thing as the Father, it's all just Jesus. Sometimes He looks like the Holy Spirit, sometimes He looks like the Father, but it's only Jesus. That's a, that's a heresy that goes all the way back into the 2 and 300s. It was called modalism, Sabellianism. It was practiced by a guy named Sibelius. And everybody knew it was heresy all the way back then. But it's being, it was revived in 1913 in Canada. It, it's just heresy. We have unfaithful and untrue witnesses. So you have untrue witnesses making lies about God and unfaithful witnesses, pastors that are afraid to stand up in their pulpit and say that. Amen? And so Jesus Christ is a faithful and true witness, and He's called us to be faithful and true witnesses. And then look at what He says. The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. What is one of the number one things being attacked in Christianity? Creation. The fact that God created the earth. Can you believe Jesus wrote that 2,000 years ago? You now, what a supernatural Bible we have. But then he goes on to describe us. Look at what it says. I know thy works, verse 15, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He doesn't, in, in the other places he addressed, in the other churches, he says you have imbibed this doctrine of Balaam. And he identifies doctrinal problems. He doesn't identify doctrinal problems with the church at Laodicea. What do we take from that? They had the right statement of faith. They had the right doctrinal positions. They just didn't care about it. So we have the right doctrinal position about the Godhead. Do we care about it? Do we care about the nature of God, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the person and power of the Holy Spirit? Do we care about that? And do we care when that doctrine is undermined, whether it's by Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Way, or Oneness Pentecostals, or Islam? We need to care about that. Why? Because people's eternal salvation are based on who God is and the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in our salvation. It's vital that we understand that. We need a revival of holy passion. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you. Do you know what we need to do sometimes at Grace Baptist Church? Just stir it up! Get some fire, get some passion, get some zeal for the truth and for the work of God. Why? Because He's worthy of it. We have to care. And in order to care, we have to know what the truth is. How many of you know people that are a part of one of the groups that I've identified today? How many of you know people that are in it? Man, we need to give them the gospel. We need to love them. Do we hate those people? No. Absolutely not. Do we think we're better than them? Absolutely not. They need the truth of the Word of God. God's given us the truth. We need to love the truth and speak the truth. Speak the truth in love. Man, when we do that, it just changes people. Amen? Let's love the truth. Let's care about the truth. Let's pray for those that we love that are in churches that teach false doctrine or in non-Christian groups. It's vital that we understand that they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.